evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Henry George School for our five session course on uh, Silvio Gazelle. The correct title is Silvio Gazelle Beyond Capitalism versus Socialism? Question mark. Our instructor throughout this journey is George Sidman, an economics and Japanese language graduate and former Wall Street financial analyst with Goldman Sachs. After Goldman, Josh worked as a Japanese equity derivative trader at Morgan Stanley in London and Tokyo. He is also the founder of and director of uh, the Silvio Gazelle Foundation, a Tennessee-based organization dedicated to promoting the ideas of Silvio Gazelle. So uh, earlier on, I had a talk with Josh. This is uh, officially a five session course, but depending on how the conversation goes, you might need to extend it. So if that's the case, then we will let everyone know. So, but uh, just for your planning. All right, so Josh, the floor is yours and thank you. All right, good evening. Um, I'd like to thank Ibrahima and the Henry George School for having me. And thanks to all of you for, for joining me tonight to talk about the economic perspective of Silvio Gussell. So by a show of hands, how many people believe that our existing economic system is generating good outcomes? More specifically, how many believe that the economic theories and practices currently in use lead to a good balance of wealth creation and distribution, broad-based opportunity and prosperity, economic stability, and a healthy relationship with the environment? Okay, unsurprisingly, not many hands were raised. In a world where people disagree about virtually everything, one thing most people can agree on is that we're not on a healthy, sustainable economic course. Unfortunately, as soon as we start talking about what needs to be done in order to solve our economic problems, that consensus breaks down. Generally speaking, when it comes to the search for solutions, most people divide themselves into two opposing camps. On one side are the capitalists, and on the other, on the other side are the socialists. Capitalists tend to believe that private parties interacting through markets with as little involvement by the government as possible is the best recipe for general prosperity. Socialists, on the other hand, believe that markets tend to unfairly enrich the owners of capital at the expense of the working class, and that we therefore need centralized authority to intervene and redistribute society's resources in a more equitable manner. Of course, there are gradations in between, but these two belief systems are the two poles that define the spectrum of mainstream economic debate. And these two groups view each other as opponents, even enemies. It would strike either group as bizarre to suggest that they might work together to arrive at a set of solutions which accomplishes the goals of both groups. These perspectives appear to share no common ground. Most people view capitalism versus socialism as an either or proposition. Choosing one implies rejection of the other. Of course, given the audience I'm speaking to tonight, this statement doesn't necessarily apply to those in attendance. Anyone who subscribes to the economic perspective of Henry George has already stepped outside of the conventional framework of economic analysis and debate. But as you're all surely aware, such folks make up a very small fraction of the overall population. The vast majority of people still buy into the dualistic capitalism versus socialism framework. But neither of these groups has a historical track record of generating good results. Capitalism generally has strong wealth creation, but most of that wealth goes to a small group at the top while the majority of people lead a precarious existence in which their basic economic needs are not assured. Whereas countries which have attempted to adopt socialism or communism typically see weak wealth creation and stagnant or declining standards of living. And both systems are perpetually plagued by frequent damaging economic crises. Expecting that either approach will provide the solutions we need is an exercise in repeating the same actions and expecting different results. So if we hope for a better economic future, it makes sense that we must step outside of the conventional capitalism versus socialism framework. 
and search for solutions that do not lie along this artificially narrow spectrum of ideas. Silvio Gassel offers a fundamentally different vision for an economic future which combines the best aspects of both systems, the powerful wealth creation of capitalism along with the equitable distribution of socialism. Furthermore, Gassel diagnoses the causes of the economic stability, instability, which seems to be an unavoidable feature of modern economies, and shows us how recurring economic crises are not inevitable. And finally, he shows us how our economic practices can be brought into harmony with the laws of nature, so that we can balance the needs of economic development with the preservation of our planet. If I may, I'd like to take a few minutes to describe my own path because I think it shows how Gassel represents a way out of an economic box that many, many people find themselves in. I was a child of the 1980s. My father is a stock analyst and commodities trader. Uh, for me, learning about the markets and economics was a way of bonding with my dad, so I became interested in the subject from an early age. One of my childhood heroes was the iconic character Gordon Gecko from the movie Wall Street. As I started my journey in economics, I subscribed to his famous motto, greed is good. I loved the idea of the free market system because it told me that I could strive to become rich and that by doing so, I would also be helping others. The free market ethos says that a system in which everyone is free to pursue his or her own self-interest results in the most efficient use of resources throughout the economic system, which maximizes the size of the economic pie and benefits everyone. It describes economic development as a rising tide that lifts all boats. It's a beautiful idea. It tells us we can have our cake and eat it too. And to the present day, I haven't given up on that idea. So I studied economics in college and then went to work in the financial industry, first as a financial analyst at Goldman Sachs in New York, and then as a derivatives trader at Morgan Stanley in London and Tokyo. But I quickly saw that the reality of capitalism didn't look like what I read about in the textbooks. I remember being in a job interview at a major financial institution and the person interviewing me was explaining in a very matter of fact way that his job was to find ways to violate the spirit of the law without breaking the letter of the law. His perspective was that powerful private sector players will always have more brain power, more resources, and stronger incentives than the government agencies overseeing them. So there will always be a lot of money to be made by staying one step ahead of the regulators. Hearing someone say this so unabashedly was eye-opening for me, and it shook the co comfortable complacency with which I embarked on my career on Wall Street. As I saw more of what went on <clears throat> in the real world, I had a hard time reconciling it with what I learned about in my economics classes. I saw the people I worked with getting rich by gaming the system, while every morning and every evening as I walked to and from work, I saw people sleeping on the sidewalks and asking me for spare change. This didn't look like a rising tide that lifts all boats. But the only alternative I was aware of was socialism or communism, which generally seemed to lead to horrible results. From the drab crumbling apartment buildings in the former Soviet Union, to millions of dead peasants resulting from China's great leap forward, I saw no evidence to support the conclusion that socialism or communism represent better alternatives to capitalism. And this was the dilemma I found myself in from my mid twenties to my mid thirties. And this is the box that most people who bother to think about economics at all tend to find themselves in. Do we just have to accept that financial operators getting fabulously wealthy by manipulating the system is a necessary price that must be paid for the benefits of the free market? Or do we have to believe that despite their historical failures, socialism or communism can be improved upon to offer a better alternative to capitalism? I couldn't get on board with either option and I wasn't aware of any other alternatives. Then in 2007, I was reading The General Theory by Keynes, and I came across an intriguing description of a man I had never heard of before. That man was Silvio Gassel. Keynes described Gassel as an unduly neglected prophet and gave a very positive assessment of his economic analysis. 
I was puzzled about why I had never heard of Gasell before. Keynes's description was compelling enough that I wanted to learn more, so I decided to go to the source and read Gasell's book, The Natural Economic Order. The fact that it was not in print in English and that I had a hard time even locating a used copy was the first clue I had about just how far off the beaten track this stuff would take me. When I finally read Gasell, what I found was a revelation. Unlike the general theory, there were no complex mathematical formulas or technical jargon. What there was was a common sense examination of the processes of wealth creation and distribution laid out in plain language that anyone can understand. And for the first time, it showed me a way out of the capitalism versus socialism box that I'd been stuck in for so long. Before getting into the specifics of what Cassell says, I wanna give a brief biographical sketch of his life. Silvio Gassell was an entrepreneur and self-taught economist born in, in 1862 in St. Vith, Germany. Due to the humble economic circumstances of his family, he didn't go to university and instead embarked on a career in business as a young man, first in Germany and Spain, and then in Argentina. It was in Argentina that he had the formative experiences which would shape his economic perspective and enable him to develop a groundbreaking understanding of the creation and distribution of wealth. As most of you probably know, Argentina has been in a state of economic crisis for more than 20 years now and just elected a controversial new president. Unfortunately, economic turbulence is nothing new for Argentina and the last couple decades of the 19th century were similarly tumultuous. Gassell arrived in Argentina in 1887 as a representative of his brother's company, which sold dental supplies. Over the next few years, Argentina would experience extreme economic instability, including bouts of runaway inflation, as well as a severe, a severe economic contraction, which had a strong impact on Gassell's business. My colleague, Carlos Luge, the founder and director of the Silvio Gassell Institute in Buenos Aires, describes Argentina as a monetary laboratory. What he means by this is that Argentina has experienced some of the most extreme economic instability in human history. And as is sometimes the case, the fundamental principles of the universe only reveal themselves under extreme conditions. It's my opinion that if Cassell hadn't experienced the economic upheaval of 1880s and 90s Argentina firsthand while running a business in the midst of it, he very well might not have had the insights which would form the basis of his economic theories and proposals. He began writing on the subject of money in 1891 and became an important voice in the Argentinian political arena, specifically in the debate over the gold standard. Gassell was a fierce critic of the gold standard, and he was the dr a driving force behind an economic reform package in 1899 that initiated a period of economic growth that would last until World War I, and during which Argentina became one of the top 10 economies in the world. Gassell moved back and forth between Argentina and Europe and expanded upon his earlier writings to publish The Natural Economic Order in 1916. The book found favor with Irving Fisher of Yale University, the most famous American economist of the time and the intellectual godfather of the New Deal. Fisher believed Gassell's ideas could represent a solution to the Great Depression and described himself as a humble servant of the merchant Gassell. He wrote his own book, essentially copying Gassell's monetary proposals and worked with the US Congress to introduce a bill based on Gassell's ideas. Unfortunately, FDR viewed the idea as too radical and the bill was never put to a vote. Gassell's ideas then received prominent treatment in the most influential economics book of the 20th century, The General Theory, which as I mentioned was where I, heard, I first heard of him. Keynes spent five pages discussing Gassell's analysis. And although he claims to have arrived at his ideas independently, it's hard not to believe that Gassell's thinking was an important influence on Keynes. A lot of people nowadays with a superficial knowledge of Gassell describe him as a Keynesian. This doesn't make any sense for a couple of reasons. First, Gassell died six years before the general theory was published. 
and Keynes was eight years old when Gassell first published his monetary proposals. Second, while Gassell and Keynes have a lot of similarities in terms of how they analyzed the causes of economic crises, they advocated very different approaches to solving the problem. We'll take a closer look at the Keynes-Gassell connection in a later class. It's a fascinating topic, and there's been some very interesting scholarship done on the subject. My friend Carlos Luz, who I just mentioned, wrote a book called Keynes and Gassell, A New Paradigm, in which he makes the case that Keynes essentially piggybacked on Gassell and ended up receiving credit for a lot of ideas that were originally developed by Gassell. Unfortunately, after World War II, Gassell's ideas declined into almost complete obscurity, and he was virtually unknown in mainstream economics for several decades. In recent years, there's been a resurgence of interest in his work, in particular following the financial crisis of 2008, during which the subject of negative interest rates prompted a number of prominent economists to revisit his ideas, notably including Greg Mankiw, a Harvard professor and former chairman of the White House Council of Economic Advisors. There have also been a number of papers published by the Federal Reserve and the IMF discussing Gassell's ideas. That being said, Gassell is still relatively unknown in the English-speaking world, and the main centers of Gassell scholarship are in Germany and South America. Before getting into the specifics of Gassell's economic perspective, I want to say a few words about the dynamics of this course. First, I want to be clear that I'm not presenting myself as an expert. I'm not a professor of economics. There are people who know a lot more about this stuff than I do. I'm simply someone with a lifelong interest in economics who has thought about the ideas of Silvio Gassell for over 15 years now. I don't claim to have it all figured out, and I don't claim to have the answers to every question. You might very well have questions that I won't be able to answer, and that's totally fine. My aim is not to build a church of Silvio Gassell. Rather, it's to understand how the world works, specifically how wealth is created and distributed, because I, I believe we can do a lot better than we're doing, and the stakes involved are extremely high. <clears throat> this is literally life and death stuff. Silvio Gassell's ideas are just the most persuasive, most compelling that I'm currently aware of. If someone comes along tomorrow and presents something even better, I'd like to think that I'd be open to it. As Gassell wrote in the introduction to the natural economic order, of the discoverer's name, truth takes no account. So we should never say such and such is true because Silvio Gassell says so, or because Adam Smith says so or because Karl Marx says so, or because Henry George says so. In fact, I believe that an important cause of the dysfunction of our existing economic system is the whole idea of authority, of relying on experts. Economics as it exists today is deliberately enshrouded in complex jargon and impenetrable mathematical formulas. This leaves the ordinary person out of the conversation entirely. We're convinced that economics is too complicated for ordinary people to understand, and that we must therefore put our trust in experts and defer to their greater wisdom. I don't believe in that approach, and neither did Gassell. He told us that even if we arrive at theoretically perfect solutions through the approach of deferring to the authority of experts, those solutions won't work. Because economics isn't physics. The economy isn't composed of particles that behave in clear, predictable ways. We are the material of the economic system. We're the cells of the economic organism. We create economic reality. And if consciousness shapes reality, how can we possibly shape a reality that does not reflect our level of consciousness? But that's what the whole idea of deferring to experts is all about. It's based on the idea that there are people smarter and wiser than us who will tell us how to live our lives even if we don't understand the reasons why. I'd like to read an excerpt from Silvio Gassell's Parable of Barataria. Uh, I should mention, by the way, that most of the sources I'll, I'll reference in this course can be found on the links page at silviogassell.com. The Parable of Barataria is a fictional account of a society that attempts to create an ideal economic and monetary system. 
In a speech to the assembled community, the leader of Maritaria says the following. We must respect our democratic institutions and refuse and, and refrain from introducing laws which are not fully understood by a majority of our people. However useful such institutions might prove to be, it would be a crime against democracy to obtain your acceptance merely by the confidence with which you honor me. Everything must be paid for in this world. The price of democracy is a travail of life's experience. We must see, observe, reflect, and learn. As Democrats, we must refuse to sanction anything that we do not understand. As long as you do not act on your own judgment, but follow blindly the judgment of others. So long as you have no confidence in yourselves, but repose full confidence in a ruling class, you are not worthy of democracy. You are the fit prey of aristocrats. You can never establish institutions in advance of your mental horizon. Power over men is seldom, if ever, used for their advancement. The state should reflect the state of mind of the majority. You must learn to examine everything for yourselves and reach the best decisions of which you're capable. That may not give you ideal government, but it will give you the government you deserve. Do not aim at institutions beyond your mental capacity. So Gassell is telling us to beware of experts, even him. Because even if the experts are wise and well-intentioned, the solutions they come up with will not work unless the members of the community understand them. It's a bottom-up rather than a top-down approach for solving our problems. And it says that any idea that is adopted on the basis of authority will fail, regardless of the theoretical, theoretical merits of the idea. Only when we have all fully thought through the ideas for ourselves and adopted them based on our own understanding and judgment will they have a chance of succeeding. So the purpose of this course is not to convert you to, to Gesellism. Remember of the discoverer's name, truth takes no account. Silvio Gesell, the man, doesn't really matter. What matters is whether or not the ideas he developed can be used to build an, a better economic future. So my goal here is simply to offer a perspective that you may not have heard before and to submit it to your judgment, your critical faculties, your sense of justice, and your understanding of the laws of nature. Having said all that, a lot of what I'm going to say will probably meet with resistance at first. I know this from many years of experience talking to people about the ideas of Silvio Gassell. I know that his perspective is very challenging for most people. It tends to make people uncomfortable. But the question is, why does it make people uncomfortable? Is it because he's wrong? Or is it because Gassell's perspective conflicts with many preconceived notions that we've built our lives upon but may never have explicitly analyzed? My belief is that it's the latter. Our economic lives are built on a foundation of ideas that most of us have never even thought about or questioned. For example, we all know that money earns interest. Most people consider this normal and natural. We learn this as children when our parents open a bank account for us or give us a savings bond as a gift. We learn at an early age that when one saves money, that money grows through interest. We also learn that when one borrows money, one has to pay back not just the amount borrowed, but an, ad an additional amount as well. But does interest really make sense? Is it logical? Is it beneficial? Is it consistent with the laws of nature? When a squirrel sets aside nuts for the winter, does he come back later and find more nuts? No, that never happens. In fact, the opposite happens. When a, when a squirrel stores nuts, some of those nuts spoil due to exposure to the elements. Some get eaten by insects, some get lost, some get stolen by other creatures. A store of nuts invariably loses value with the passage of time. And this is a nearly universal aspect of nature. We live in a universe characterized by increasing entropy. Physical matter tends to move from a state of greater order to a state of less order. And because of this, law of nature, almost all forms of physical wealth lose value with the passage of time. 
So why does money behave in the exact opposite way? Why does money gain value with the passage of time when everything else loses value? This is an example of a simple, straightforward question that most of us have probably never thought about, but which affects virtually every aspect of our economic lives. So this course is as much about examining the ideas that form the foundation of the economic status quo and asking if they make sense as it is about promoting a specific set of solutions to our economic problems. A big part of the work that needs to be done in order to build a better economic future involves consciously examining modes of thought that are irrational, harmful, or unnatural. Because since our consciousness shapes reality, if our understanding of economics is flawed, our economic reality will be flawed as well. There are very few new ideas that one needs to learn in order to understand the Gesellian perspective. Most of the work that needs to be done in order to grasp Gesell's viewpoint is to discard previous preconceived notions that don't hold up to logical scrutiny or that are not consistent with the laws of nature. But this is not an easy or comfortable process. I can tell you in advance that a lot of what I'm going to say is going to bring up questions, doubts, or even discomfort. Imagine for a moment that I could prove to you by way of undeniable logical argument that what we have always believed to be the vertical direction is not in fact vertical. Let's say I could convince you at an intellectual level that this is actually vertical. Would that logical proof enable you to immediately incorporate that truth into your life? Would you immediately start to see that all buildings, all doorways, all street signs are in fact crooked? No, because intellectual knowledge is only a small part of human experience. So simply grasping something at an intellectual level is not enough to enable us to fully incorporate it into our understanding of the world. And the same is true of the Gesellian economic perspective. The intellectual part of it is actually quite simple. Here it is. Private ownership of land is unnatural, and our existing form of money is irrational. That's it. That's the whole Gesellian perspective. The rest of it is all thinking through the ramifications of these two ideas. But simply convincing people of those two things at an intellectual level is only part of what's needed in order for them to be able to incorporate the Gesellian perspective into their understanding of the world. Because we have a lifetime of experiences standing in the way. Every crooked door frame will still look straight a minute, an hour, or a day after I demonstrate logically that it's not. And that's essentially the case I'm making regarding economics. Due to some fundamentally flawed ideas which form the foundation of our economic lives, every single structure built on that foundation is crooked. Every single economic transaction that takes place in a system with irrational, unnatural systems of money and land is irrational and unnatural. So if I make an intellectually convincing argument that interest is artificial, irrational, and harmful, does that mean people are gonna suddenly start lending money without interest? No. Absorbing and in, in integrating new ideas is something that takes time, and it requires more than just intellectual argumentation. We need to experience the truth of these ideas. And since the world as we know it is built on other ideas, the status quo is a big impediment to understanding. All of the structures and patterns we live by reinforce the existing perspective. So making the transition is a long, arduous process that must include more than just thinking about it. It must also include lived experience. In the last session of this course, we'll talk about just that. How might we create lived experiences which incorporate Gesellian principles and enable us to integrate the Gesellian perspective into our lives? Okay, without further ado, what did Gesell say? Gesell asked the same question that Karl Marx and Henry George asked. Why does the incredible, incredibly powerful engine of wealth creation of capitalism seem to invariably lead to widespread poverty, ever-increasing wealth inequality, and recurring economic crises. 
Why does capitalism not create a rising tide that lifts all boats? Marx concluded that, that private ownership of capital inevitably leads to economic exploitation, and therefore labor will never receive its full proceeds as long as capital is privately owned. Henry George had a very different answer. He said that the free market system would in fact lead to a rising tide that lifts all boats if it wasn't for one thing, private ownership of land. He was a believer in the free market system, but he saw that private land ownership causes much of the wealth created by capitalism to flow into the pockets of landowners instead of raising the living standards of the working class. Silvio Gassell agreed with Henry George's analysis of the land problem. However, he believed that George's diagnosis of the causes of our economic problems was incomplete. Gassell adds another dimension to Henry George's explanation of the causes of economic dysfunction. He shows how our irrational form of money prevents it from circulating in the way that we need it to in order for the free market system to deliver on its promises of robust wealth creation, <clears throat> broad-based prosperity, and economic stability. If we think of money as the blood of the economic organism, Gassell tells us that due to our incorrect understanding and formulation of money, the blood that currently flows through our system is as if it were magnetically charged. Instead of flowing freely and naturally to where it's needed and in the correct quantities, it instead flows toward where there is already too much of it and away from where there's not enough. And this basic insight explains a great deal of the general dysfunction we see in our economic system. It explains why we continue to see poverty no matter how much wealth we create. It explains why our system always trends toward greater wealth inequality. It explains why capitalist economies are always prone to periodic economic crises. And it explains our unsustainable relationship with the environment. So Gassell starts by affirming the correctness of free market theory. He believes that a system based on individual freedom, private property, and free competition is essential for the material progress of mankind. Does that mean he was a capitalist? Absolutely not. Most people consider the terms capitalism and the free market system as synonyms, but they're not. According to Gassell, what we know as capitalism is a pathological variant of the free market system that has resulted from the fact that we have fundamentally misunderstood the correct and natural roles and functions of land and money. He shows that our existing systems of land and money are violations of the core principles of the free market system. Therefore, the solution isn't to throw out the baby with the bathwater, as Marx wanted to do, and replace free markets with centralized control of the economy. Rather, what we need to do is fix the two problems of money and land. If we do that, Gassell says that the free market system will in fact do what the textbooks say it should do and create a rising tide that lifts all boats. The common element that ties together the subjects of land and money is that both are instances of improper appropriation of the commons. What are the commons? The commons are natural or cultural resources that, that, that by their nature belong to society as a whole and should be managed in the interests of the whole community. Examples of the commons are things like water, air, public airwaves, etc. They're things that no private individual creates and therefore cannot be held as private property without doing grave harm to the community. I'm sure I don't need to explain why it would be unacceptable to allow anyone to privatize air. Gassell tells us that money and land, properly understood, should be considered as parts of the commons. And he furthermore shows that this is completely consistent with the concepts of private property and free markets. The core idea of the free market system is that people should be allowed to pursue whatever activities they choose, that they should compete with, with, with each other on a level playing field, and that they should be allowed to keep and dispose of whatever wealth they create in whatever way they see fit with as little interference from the government as possible. But money and land properly understood are not wealth. Did that statement make you feel uncomfortable? 
because what I just said is an example of what I discussed earlier. Ideas which conflict with preconceived notions that we have built our economic lives upon, but may never have consciously thought about. Most people would say, of course, money and land are forms of wealth. But what is wealth? It turns out that's not such a simple question. Is gold wealth? Is a tree wealth? Is water wealth? In order to answer those questions, we first need to agree on a definition of the word wealth. Adam Smith defined wealth as the possession of useful and transferable material objects whose acquisition or production implies labor. Personally, I think that's a pretty good definition, although we could have a whole discussion about how best to define wealth. Unfortunately, we don't have time for that tonight. If we use Smith's definition, gold, which has been dug out of the ground and given the form of bars or jewelry is wealth because it's useful, transferable, material, human labor has been expended to produce it, and someone possesses it. But what about gold still buried in the ground? Is that wealth? Gold buried in the ground does not fulfill Smith's definition, because no human labor has been expended to produce it. What about water? Well, once again, it depends. Water flowing in a river is not wealth, according to Smith's definition. But bottled water is wealth. What about land and money? Does human labor create land and money? No. But perhaps an even more significant way in which money does not fulfill the definition of wealth is in whether or not it is useful. So now we need to define the word useful. Again, most people would immediately object to the statement that money is not useful. But I would argue that this is a correct and accurate statement. What does the word useful mean? It means something that directly fulfills a human need. Food is obviously useful. Clothing is useful. A house is useful. But what direct use does money have? If I give you a $100 bill, what direct use can you get from it without exchanging it for something else? I suppose you could burn it to warm yourself for three or four seconds, but other than that, a $100 bill has no direct usefulness. Money is obviously very important, but that doesn't mean it's useful or that it's wealth. From a Gesellian perspective, money is not wealth. It's a means with which to affect the exchange of wealth. But wealth and the means to exchange wealth are not the same thing. But to the conventional way of thinking, what's more universally thought of as wealth than land and money? Allowing the commons to be privately owned and treated as wealth rather than as vital public resources which should be viewed as naturally belonging to society as a whole is irrational and harmful. Improper appropriation of the vital public resources, land, and money gives rise to the phenomenon of unearned income. This means that wealth flows into the pockets of people who have not contributed to the creation of that wealth. And obviously, if wealth is going to people who have not created it, <clears throat> there's not enough left over to fairly compensate those who have. I like to say that the entire Gesellian perspective can fit on a cocktail napkin. Here it is. If you receive income without creating wealth, someone else is creating wealth without receiving income. That's the whole Gesellian perspective. Really, that's the whole thing. Appropriation of the commons results in certain members of society receiving unearned income. They receive wealth they have not created. And if some people receive wealth they haven't created, obviously the people who did create it can't receive the full amount of wealth they've created. It's really that simple. The rest is all elaboration of this basic idea. And this is why this course is titled Beyond Capitalism Versus Socialism. Seen from this perspective, the solution to our problems will never be found by choosing between capitalism and socialism. Rather, what Gassell tells us is that free markets and the goals of socialism are not opposed at all. They are, in fact, completely consistent. Of course, here we need to once again 
examine how we define words. Much like capitalism and, free, and the free market system, most people consider socialism and Marxism to be synonyms. But Marxism is just one version of socialism. There are many others. The very first words of the natural economic order address this point. Gassell writes, the abolition of unearned income of so-called surplus value, also termed interest and rent, is the immediate economic aim of every socialistic movement. The method generally proposed for the attainment of this aim is communism in the shape of nationalization or socialization of production. I know of only one socialist, Pierre Joseph Proudhon, whose investigations into the nature of capital point to the possibility of another solution of the problem. The demand for nationalization of production is advocated on the plea that the nature of the means of production necessitates it. It is usually asserted offhand as a truism that ownership of the means of production must necessarily in all circumstances give the capitalist the upper hand when bargaining with the workers about wages. An advantage represented and destined eternally to be represented by surplus value or capital interest. No one except Proudhon was able to conceive that the preponderance now manifestly on the side of property can be shifted to the side of the dispossessed, the workers, simply by the construction of a new house beside every existing house, of a new factory beside every factory already established. So if we can agree that Marx doesn't define socialism, but is just one type of socialism, and that what actually defines socialism is the goal of enabling workers to receive the full proceeds of their labor, then what Cassell tells us is that communism will never achieve that goal. Rather, the only way for workers to receive the full proceeds of their labor is through the perfection of the free market system. So this completely upends the whole framework of economic debate, which sees free markets and socialism as opposed and mutually exclusive alternatives. Gassell tells us that, that they are entirely consistent and compatible. So to return for a moment to my own journey, I first encountered these ideas in 2007 when I was in my mid thirties. Gassell's analysis made complete sense to me, but I asked myself how I had never heard of any of this before. How did I do a degree in economics and work in the financial industry without ever hearing the name Silvio Gassell? I assumed at first that I must be missing something. There must be some fly in the ointment that I wasn't seeing. Because if the truth was really that simple, I would have heard of this guy before. So the first thing I did was make a trip back to my college, Union College in Schenectady, New York, to meet with my favorite economics professor. This was a guy who I had enormous respect for. I took every course he offered. Surely he would be able to help me sort all of this out. So we sat down 15 years or so after I'd last seen him, and I started telling him about reading The Natural Economic Order. I asked him why I had never heard of Silvio Gassell before. And much to my surprise, he told me that he hadn't heard of Silvio Gassell before either. This was the second clue I got about how far off the beaten track this stuff would take me. For the next several years, I kept looking for someone to enlighten me. What was I missing about Silvio Gassell's perspective? because if his arguments were correct, it just didn't make sense that no one knows about him. So I started writing articles about Gassell and tried to talk about his ideas to anyone who would listen. And every time I came across a mention of him in print or online, I would try to get in touch with the writer in the hopes that they could enlighten me. In just one example, when I saw Greg Mankiw, the Harvard professor and chairman of the White House Council of Economics Advisors, mention Gassell, I wrote him an email. He was kind enough to reply. I'll read you his email in its entirety. Dear Josh, I'm afraid that I cannot help out here. You're right, the Cassell has largely faded into obscurity. I do not know of anyone to point you toward. Greg. For years, I kept writing and reaching out to people, expecting that someone would finally show me the problem with Gassell's analysis, point out to me the flaw that I wasn't seeing. 
But up to today, that still hasn't happened. And with every year that passes, my level of confidence grows that there isn't a flaw and that the world just hasn't yet grasped the truth of what Cassell showed us. And finally, just to bring my own story up to the present day, after 10 plus years of shouting into the void, about four years ago, I finally made contact with an international network of Gazelle advocates and researchers. As I'd been doing for years, I wrote an email to a German economist named Werner Onken, who has written extensively about Gazelle. One of his associates immediately responded to my email, and she put me in touch with the Silvio Gazelle Institute in Argentina, since I live in South America and speak Spanish. I then started working with both groups, the Germans and the Argentinians, at first with translating and proofreading. And over time, it became clear to me and to them that there's a need for an English language hub for all things Gazelle related. And since no one else was doing it, I decided, well, I guess I'll do it. And that's how the Silvio Gazelle Foundation came into existence. I hope that it will become a center for English language Gazelle scholarship and advocacy. I invite all of you to check out our website at silviogasell.com. There you'll find a lengthy list of links, books, articles, videos, as well as our own Substack newsletter, YouTube channel, Twitter, Reddit, etc. So that's everything I wanted to talk about today. To conclude, I'd just like to give you a preview of what's to come in the coming weeks. Starting next time, we'll delve into Silvio Gasell's analysis of money. We'll start with the basic question of what money is and what it does, and we'll proceed step by step to show how our improperly conceived form of money gives rise to many of the big picture problems which have plagued economies for thousands of years. After that, we'll look at Gassell's simple proposal to reformulate money in such a way that it will properly perform its role as the blood of the economic organism so that it will flow naturally and freely to every part of the system and provide the energy and information that are required for each cell of the economy to properly perform its function. After that, we'll look at Silvio Gassell's analysis of land ownership, because while he analyzed the, the, the problem the same way Henry George did, he proposed a different solution. Since this course is being offered by the Henry George School, I'm sure we'll have a spirited discussion when it comes time to compare and contrast uh, Henry George's proposed solution with that of Silvio Gassell. After that, we'll look at Gassell's analysis from the vantage point of other important economic perspectives throughout history. We'll go all the way back to the ancient world and see how Gassell's ideas have some very important points in common with Aristotle and the world's major religions. We'll compare Gassell and the classical economists. We'll compare Gassell and Marx. We'll compare Gassell and Henry George. We'll talk about Gassell in relation to modern monetary theory. And as I mentioned before, we'll, cons we'll compare Gassell and Keynes. <clears throat> and then in the final section, uh, sorry, in the final session will be entitled Gassell in the Real World. We'll look at a number of instances in which his ideas have actually been implemented. I'll also describe a few initiatives that we're working on at the Silvio Gasell Foundation to put his ideas into practice, both in local communities and online. And last but not least, no economic discussion these days would be, would be complete without mentioning Bitcoin. As anyone who follows us on Twitter will know, I'm not a big fan of Bitcoin. Essentially, I view it as the polar opposite of what Gasell proposed. But I do think the cryptocurrency space holds some intriguing possibilities for implementing Gassell's ideas in the, in the digital age. In fact, Gassell's ideas are already being used in a number of crypto projects. So at this point, I'd be happy to take any questions or hear any thoughts that any of you might have. Thank you very much, Josh, for this uh, very brilliant lecture. Uh, we are open for questions. You may... Uh, Marty Rollins, yes. Marty, go ahead. Oh, great. Uh, thanks, Josh. It's, uh, um, I'm looking forward to the uh, complete course. Uh, I do want to point out that there's a lot of uh, um, there's a lot of thoughts that Henry George had on money 
that really haven't been explored by people who call themselves Georgists. Uh, I just recently gave a, a talk about the, the money question, which I think is probably recorded by now, but it, it seems like the, the ideas were uh, the same that uh, uh, Giselle came up with about uh, not being wealth, uh, just like what you were describing. So um, could you uh, uh, explore any of the uh, uh, um, possibilities that Giselle read any of uh, Henry George? Because it seems like the uh, it's more than just an overlay. It's uh, very close uh, ideas. Giselle definitely did read Henry George. He mentions mm -hmm. Henry George. Um, mm -hmm. I I attended your class last week. Um, it was right. incredibly well timed for me in preparing this class. Yeah, I do remember. Um, however, I think that we will agree when we get to the end of the presentation on Silvio Gasell's perspective on money that it is quite different from um, from anything that I've heard either from my own reading of Henry George or from what you discussed in your class last week. Um, I would say we should probably table this particular question until, one, until we've covered all of that ground and then we can revisit this question. And um, like, like I said, of the discoverer's name, truth takes no account. To me, it's not important um, who thought of it first. What yeah. is important is who got it right um, so that we can get it right. I agree. Thanks. Anthony. Josh, thanks for a great introduction. I can't wait for the, the rest of the course. Um, I have some questions, but you will cover them in the course. So the only comment that I have was when you said almost all forms of natural wealth lose value with the passage of time. Uh, one of the explanations of why we need interest was given to me by somebody who said that um, in the competition for capital, any money invested in crops or livestock or timber do increase in value over time. And therefore, if competition was to go into, if capital was to go into say manufacturing, then the capitalist would say, all right, I've got this bunch of money. I could invest it in crops or livestock or timber or whatever, and that will grow in time. Or I could invest it in manufacturing or industry. But my my capital won't grow in time. So therefore I must charge interest so that it evens the playing field between those other natural investments and manufacturing. So that that sort of made sense to me as, as to why we need interest, but I'm, I'm happy to be persuaded otherwise. But there, there are three examples that jumped to my mind that of natural assets that do increase in value over time. Yeah, you're describing a Georgist perspective on interest. Um, we will, in the next three sessions, focus almost entirely on the subject of interest. It's incredibly complex, in my opinion. Um, and part of that discussion will be um, reviewing all of the major, major competing theories of interest and asking if they hold up to um, logical scrutiny. The theory that you're referring to, generally speaking, is the fructification theory. Um, there are basically three or four broad categories of theories of interest, and we will go through each of them and discuss whether or not they make sense. Um, certainly, the growth principle of nature is, um, is an important part of the picture. Um, 
I can't go any further into it because it would take a whole another hour or two. Yeah, I'll be Alison. patient. Alison. Thanks, Josh, anyway. Thank you very much for a great introduction from your personal perspective too and how you got interested and thank you for your deep dive and putting together the foundation and creating this resource for us. It's gonna be an awesome course and um, even hinting just from this awesome question about interest that we'll go into more deeply. And I would recommend to the questioner about interest and maybe to all of us to to check out Giselle's um, Robinson Crusoe piece that's linked on your website. Yeah, that gives an interesting perspective, Sylvia's perspective on interest that allows for deeper discussion. And wanted to say, um, I've been teaching about Giselle as a high school teacher for the past 10 years. It has encouraged me by finding out about him through, through discovering Wargle and um, the miracle of Wargle. And um, if that's not already linked into your website, I can share a link to, to the film. Um, and, and, and through that, ag agreeing with you entirely that we can teach how to design for a third way that gets us past divisiveness into things that really work, that align with nature. And spent the last year in Kenya working, as you mentioned, with one project that is using blockchain um, in order to uh, create vouchers um, in rural areas in, in Africa uh, throughout, including refugee camps. And um, the name of the film is Shillings from Heaven. And I can share a link at some point with the group, unless it's already on the website. And uh, the name of the organization that's using uh, blockchain to implement a gazellian model is grassroots economics. And that's one good example that we can look at today. Well, well documented. So I just wanted to share that and celebrate. So thanks. The uh, both of those things, shillings from heaven and the Robinson Crusoe parable can be found on the links page at silviogasell.com. Also, I am going to read the entire Robinson Crusoe parable from beginning to end. It is so central to understanding interest from a Gasellian perspective. It's 12 minutes long. I've clocked it, uh, but we're going to read the whole thing because it is so important. Um, but if anybody wants to take a look at it before we do that, you can link to it from our links page. Thanks. Joe. Thanks so much for that presentation. And I too am looking forward to uh, the other uh, sessions. Um, your reaction to not hearing about Giselle uh, matches mine. And I also wondered why, and I never heard of Henry George except in passing um, and uh, the Chicago plan except in passing. So uh, it's, it is kind of curious. Um, my question is, uh, did Henry George study um, the greenbacks? Uh, it's right to, I'm sorry if I said that wrong. Did did Silvio Giselle study the greenbacks? Did um, I know uh, uh, George was a greenbacker? Uh, did Giselle also look into that and adopt that kind of thinking? Thank you. I'm not specifically aware if he ever addressed <laughs> the greenbacks, but he certainly. Um, he certainly agrees with the principle of the greenbacks, which is that uh, government can and should um, create currency, um, fiat currency, essentially, uh, to meet the needs of the economy um, without any connection with backing. And that's a topic that we're going to discuss whether money should be backed by gold, by silver, by anything else. Um, Gasell tells us absolutely not, that backing is uh, counterproductive from uh, the point of view of understanding money's true function. To, to sort of just give a, 
a, a 15 second preview of what we're gonna talk about for the next three sessions. Cassell says that the medium of exchange function of money is the only appropriate function of money. And that marrying our medium of exchange with a store of value is the cardinal sin. And that that's what leads to interest and that's what leads to all of the dysfunction of our monetary system. Sorry, uh, what did you say was the cardinal sin? Marrying those two functions together, medium of exchange, store of value. Gotcha. Thank you. Right. Uh, Dr. Perry. Uh, thank you, Ibrahim. Uh, thank you, Josh. In your spirit of it doesn't matter where we give credit as long as we get it right, I would uh, suggest that in the 50 plus years since 1971, since effectively the world has been on a pure fiat standard, that we have achieved gazillion money um, because there isn't any money anymore. There's only credit and credit is a wasting asset in the same way that labor is a wasting asset. And they are on parity in the current fiat world precisely because credit which isn't put to use rots. And, you know, Gazelle was not the first to discover that. Uh, I think Richard Cantillon was um, the idea that the closer you sit to the king, the more your money is worth. Uh, but it doesn't matter where we give credit as long as we see that what's actually happening in the economy is that the creation of fiat is, is the creation of credit. And that credit is either put to use in the productive economy or it's put to use in financialization of either assets or government favored labor, which creates bubbles. And those bubbles create either price inflation or wage inflation. Separate from that, a quibble, but I think this particular quibble goes right to the heart of the matter. Um, I would suggest that we quit using the phrase unearned income. There is no such thing that can be definitively proven. Henry George realized that. He used the term unearned increment, which he got from John Stuart Mill, who proved the difference. And the difference is crucial. There is no such thing as unearned income because all income derives from the input of either capital or labor into an environment which has to include the land. And if it derives from this solely the input of capital, that capital itself derives from an earlier input of labor. So you're dealing with the same thing, only with a longer chain of etiology to define it. On the other hand, the unearned increment is exactly what both John Stuart Mill and Henry George saw as the problem. If there can be unearned capital gain in the ownership of the land, because the land is made more valuable by the productive activity of the community, then that's the point at which a putative store of value siphons off the real wealth of the community. And that's the thing we need to seek to prevent. Okay, lots to respond there. You said a lot. Um, I'm gonna take it from the back, back from the end and then go toward the beginning. Um, to the question of whether the term unearned income is accurate or useful, um, seems to me that it that it ultimately boils down to a, an issue of semantics. Um, I'm not sure that it is a make or break consideration on what it what conclude what practical conclusions it leads us to. Um, we'll see um, once we go through the the whole argument if 
if a substantive difference remains. I suspect that it won't, uh, but I'm happy to revisit this question uh, in the last session. Um, the first thing you said was that we don't need Gasellian money because we've already got it. Uh, I think I'm accurately paraphrasing what you said. I could not disagree more with that statement. Um, I've written an article specifically about that point um, because it's a very common response when people hear the Gasellian proposal for demurrage. Uh, people, nine times out of 10, the, the word for word, why do we need demurrage if we already have inflation? They are not the same thing. And, I, and uh, you can find that article on our Substack. Um, we will also be talking specifically about that point, probably in the fourth session of this course. Great. Thanks, uh, Nick. Hey, uh, Josh, thank you for all this and the presentation and for the invite I got through the Institute to be on this. I'm I'm not an economist at all. My background is actually in uh, music, but I have an interest in Silvio Gazelle. And so uh, just as one comment and then one question, but the comment is um, I'm really looking forward to later in the course when you are talking about some ways that we can try to get active and implement this in local communities. That's going to be really useful for me. I, it's it's a uh, it's hard to talk about this with people, especially in my circle of people who don't have a finance background, and I don't have a finance background. So, but um, and then the question I have is, your lecture earlier. I mean, are are we going to have access to these? Uh, recordings or is there going to be a way that we can I started to try to take some notes but it was a lot that you were saying which I appreciate that but it was I just sat back and listened instead and tried not to keep up with that. but that that's my question thank you so much yes this course is being recorded it will be available after the course is complete um, both through the Henry George School and also through the Silvio Gasell Foundation YouTube channel. Great. Uh, Tyler, you need to uh, unmute. Um, hello. Um, hello. Yes. Um, yeah. I it's funny that the last person who was speaking talked about not being an economist and having a music background. That is the same as me. I am a blind musician from Michigan. And um, I just, um, I'm actually uh, not a Georgist. I'm a Gesellian. So I found this course from the foundation, uh, I think in a blog post in the foundation. Um, so I'm actually not a Georgist. I'm a, I'm a Gesellian, and I heard about George in passing, but finally a couple of days ago I read about him. But yeah, I'm more of a Gesellian, and the one thing that I'm curious about as a Gesellian is when I see the different implementations of Gesell, um, um. You usually more about demurrage money than um, land stuff, obviously. But whenever I see, like, whether it's from the 30s, like Virgil, Austria, or modern, um, modern examples would be like the Chiemgauer in Germany. And then, of course, in, um, in the digital currency space, there are things like Freikoin and Palai. Um, I actually got into demurrage because of Pella. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm in my mid twenties, and I started my money journey, currency journey in crypto and digital currency. But um, I always wondered, did Gasell have a preference? Did, um, because notice I mentioned Teamgower and Pella in the same sentence. Teamgower local. It's accepted in a couple cities. 
just like Virgil, it's a, a, it's a Virgil, it's a city currency. Ally, worldwide currency. I've spent it on Korean stuff in Korea, like like sent Ally from America to Korea. Did Giselle prefer local currency and be like, "Don't use this for a country or worldwide," or was he like, uh, like did he prefer local currency? Did he prefer um like Virgil or Kingauer, or did he pr prefer national or international like Palai or Franklin? But um, because I know some, because I know I I think it was I don't know if it was um, I don't know if it was somebody in Virgil like present day Virgil who wanted um, who wanted to bring Gasellian ideas back or um, um, I, but they have this bitter hatred for Palai, and I have a feeling that it had something to do with, um, 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 it being a, an international currency, maybe a lot of Gesellians prefer a local currency, like Virgil was, or Kimgauer is now. So did, uh, did Gesell prefer, um, was he okay with um, Dimmeridge being used nationally or internationally, or was he a local dude when it came to Dimmeridge? Gisell was, as far as I know, <clears throat> he never talked about local com complementary currencies. He was talking about national and international currencies. Um, and this is, this is going to be a topic for the last session of the course. Um, you know, when, if one accepts the Gasellian analysis and proposal. The next question is, what do you do with that? Are you gonna get the United States government to change their form of money? Are you gonna get any national government to do that? Uh, I think extraordinarily unlikely in today's world that that's gonna happen. So I wrestled with that question for a long time. And the conclusion that I personally came to is that these ideas can sort of, that we can try to accomplish so-called proof of concept at a local or digital level. Um, and if the ideas prove out, if they generate the results that they that 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 Gassell says they should, that I believe they should, um, then you should be able to demonstrate that in practice. And Virgil is an important um, piece of data. Unfor unfortunately, Virgil only lasted 13 months. Um, so it's kind of hard. And, and the population of Virgil was four or 5,000 people. So it's kind of hard to say that that represents definitive proof of a theory of money, um, but the results were very much in keeping with what any Gasellian would have hoped for. Um, but yeah, so long story short, Gassell was talking about national and international currencies. As far as I know, he never even considered the possibility of local complementary currencies, which is much more part of today's Gasellian community. Um, um, uh, one, um, uh, one, one more bit. I, I'm kind of wondering. Um, why do you, um, why do you think, whether they know the name Gasell or not, like I said, it's, um, for example, it's not mentioned. The name is not mentioned in, um, Pali, for example. But, um, how come it seems like even when people do, whether they know Gisell or not, when they use Gisellian ideas, it's always the demurrage money. You rarely hear people talk about land. Like, um, for example, I, I may have even seen that as a hashtag, hashtag Freigelt on Twitter in like 2020. Um, so um, the point being, it feels like Gisellians are more likely to talk about a demurrage money than the land proposal. Why, um, why do you think that is? That's a fantastic question. Um, if we weren't talking to the Henry George School right now, um, 
this would be a very different conversation because the Henry George School is all about um, belief that private ownership of land is, if not, well, the, the Henry George perspective is that that is the central issue. The Gesellian perspective is that there are two central issues, one of which is private land ownership. Um, but if we were talking to the general public and not the Henry George School, it's a very inflammatory subject to get into. Just because quite, just to put it in black and white, Gassell calls for nationalization of land ownership. Um, anyone who has not been prepared to think about that is going to respond negatively. Um, myself and every Gesellian in the world knows that. Um, and each one of us has to decide how we're gonna deal with that fact. Um, a lot of Gesellians choose to talk only about money um, because they know how inflammatory the land side of the subject can be. And they feel like they have a lot to offer the world just with the analysis of money. I don't subscribe to that. because I don't think that the two issues can be separated. Um, I think they have to be dealt with together. Um, and just to try to keep it brief, here's why. If you, if you deny money the store of value function, which is essentially what Gasell proposes to do, to make money so that it cannot be used for the purpose of storing wealth, what is the next most obvious vehicle that people are going to use to store wealth? Land. Um, so I was, I, uh, I was going to say precious metals, but go on. I, precious metals for sure, but I would say even more so land. So I think implementing the monetary side of Gazelle without the land side would potentially be disastrous. At best, it wouldn't work. So I think that they absolutely need to be seen as parts of a unified, um, program. Thank you, uh, Joris. All right, uh, thank you, Josh, for uh, for your presentation. Uh, I say thank thank you because I think uh, well, I agree that it's very much needed to discuss uh, these kind of ideas, and uh, I appreciate your uh, initiative and your work. Um, well, and you outlined all the things you want to discuss in the in the following um, session. So uh, there, there's lots of ground to cover that we can't all cover now. But I just uh, I just want to mention uh, that I'm also very much fascinated by uh, Silvio Gesell's time in Germany uh, because many people know about the the Wurgel, um experiment, which occurred, I think. Uh, even after he died or near about uh, that time. But before that, there were some, uh, well, there were some followers of, of his or his ideas who implemented some stuff in Germany. Uh, and Silvio Gazelle himself even uh, got to be a minister of uh, finance in the Free Republic of uh, Bavaria. Um, For six days. I was just going to say, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was about uh, as long as he was tolerated. Uh, and then he got a court case. But any, anyway, I, I I know some stuff about that, but there's still some mystery about it as well for me. So it intrigues me. And uh, I, I wanted to say this. And also, I'm interested to know if, um, yeah, if, if we will discuss this a bit as well or not. I'm going to make a note to myself to to add the Bavarian Economics Ministry um, chapter. I didn't didn't plan to talk about that. Um, yeah, it's it's not so much uh, for the monetary architecture relevant, but historically, it's it's yes. very much fascinating as well. It is, and 
just yeah to very briefly talk about that chapter he was economics minister of a socialist government that he completely disagreed with their economic philosophy but he said to them i will be your economics minister if you let me implement my monetary system even though i completely disagree with your all everything you think about economics and they said you can do that um the government, it was it was the government that fell. It wasn't that they threw Silvio Gassel himself out. Um, the government only lasted a week. Um, and he made uh, what for me is a stunning piece of oratory in his own defense at the trial that followed. Uh, for anyone who wants to look it up, to me, it's one of the best speeches I've ever read. Uh, it was, and he got himself acquitted by, you know, largely by popular acclaim because he made such a stirring and compelling case um, in his own defense. Uh, it's a fascinating chapter, and I'm going to make a note to myself to uh, to think about whether whether we have time to to talk about that. All right, just one more uh, thing that uh, is is relevant uh, from a historical perspective to think about the the relationship between the uh the nazis the uh, the nazis uh, from the hitler party in their early days uh to to gazelle and his ideas that is uh very interesting as well because well they had some some comments on interest as well they uh they didn't do very well in um implementing uh, uh, the, their original ideas, I would say. But it's very interesting how, how that developed and turned out. Yeah, I mean, it's important to, to keep in mind when we are looking at historical events, when Gassel lived and when he died. He died in 1930. So um, all of the, you, you were saying before, you know, the Virgil, before that, there was um, some implementation of his ideas in, in Germany in 1932. I'm not aware of any that actually took place during his life. Um, oh, there were. There were. Okay. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to, to know about them because the first that I'm aware of is 1932. Um, in the 1920s, there were about 200 firms, but it wasn't uh, in, in Germany, I think, but uh, it wasn't organized by uh, Silvio Gazelle himself, but just some some guy who was in, in dire need during a deflation. Uh, the, Are you talking the... about the VAR, the VARA? Exactly. Network? Yes. Yeah, but that, that, that was not, I mean, at best, that was in the very last years of Gazelle's life. 1924 or something. Okay, well, the, I mean, the, the first concrete application of the VARA network was the Spunnenkirchen mine, um, which was 1932. Um, but you, you may very well be right that there was a network of businesses that agreed to accept a demurrage currency um, under the umbrella of the VARA network. Yes. Yes, and I think it was a bit er er earlier, like I said, but th that's a detail. <laughs> Thanks for responding. Sure. Great. Thank you. So we have three more uh, questions waiting. Uh, we go with Yanis. Yanis, you are muted. Yes. Uh... I have a question about uh, the things you said about uh, green backing, and you said government should have, uh, you know, the the right to print money. The question is, should the money be printed before the production of goods and services, or after? I don't know how it's a practically realistic question because we're not starting from a place where there are no goods and services. Um, we're starting from a world in which 
There's extremely advanced division of labor. There's global capital markets, uh, even in the time of Gassel, much more so today. So I, I don't know, I would have to understand the purpose of the question to, to, to have any sense of how to answer it. No money, like, like let's think for example, uh, like what happened, let's say with, with, uh, with COVID, you know, uh, by the stroke of a pen, the economy closes, right? So the mm -hmm. economy closes means production stalls, right? And with production stalled, we go and we print like I don't know how many, how many trillions. Would Gesell do that? Or Gesell would say, okay, restart the economy. And then as people start working and exchanging, then at the end, we're going to say, okay, what did you produce? Okay, here is. New okay. money, set money printed and 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 given to you. That's okay. It. Now now I understand your question much better. Um the best I can answer is that Gassell's number one and only rule for regulating the money supply is complete price stability. So he is not an inflationist. He is not a Keynesian. Um, so no, he would absolutely not have advocated um, just cranking up the, uh, the printing presses come hell or high water for the purpose of um, for the purpose of preventing um, you know, meltdown of an overly leveraged, financial system by whatever means necessary. All right, Ed Dotson. Uh, really interesting, Josh. Uh, I've read Gazelle. I have his book, uh, and uh, but I have to go back and read it again now that you're going to challenge us. Uh, my, I don't really have any something substantive to say other than listening to you in your personal experience it just uh, very much reminded my, me of my own since I was in the banking sector and I spent my last 20 years at Fannie Mae. There was a difference, though. Uh, I was able to get the senior people with Fannie, Ma Fannie Mae to see the connection between the property tax system and the decrease in affordable housing. And so my company actually gave me the charge to go around and give lectures on the importance of moving to a two-rate property tax structure in order to ease the pressure on land prices and therefore make affordable housing more um, uh, available. The sad part is I was known as the Henry George guy at Fannie Mae. And when I retired, there was no one to take my place. There was no one who had the same commitment or perspectives. And so uh, everyone just went back to the standard thinking that they were getting from all of the experts, you know, who were involved in housing policy, you know, Harvard in particular, but Stanford and the, and the other schools. And it's so frustrating when you feel like you've seen the light and you can't find enough people to to grasp the same insight that you have to to result in some sort of critical mass for change. And I think that's probably the feeling of a lot of us that are joining you in this. Well, I think I'm surprised you had as much success as you just said that you had in terms of getting people in that industry to open their minds. Um, the conclusion that I came to through my experience with people in that industry is that they will probably be the last human beings on earth to come around to what uh, Gasell was talking about, because their entire identities are built on the foundation of the status quo. So even if they don't necessarily grasp at an intellectual logical level that what we're talking about here would represent an existential threat. 
to a lot of what they do. I think they, even before that, they grasp at an emotional level that this is dangerous stuff and that they better not understand it. Um, that's my perspective. Mm -hmm. I would accept any invitation to go back to Goldman Sachs and, or Morgan Stanley and, mm -hmm. and talk to them about Silvio Gasell, but I am not holding mm -hmm. my breath. I, I may have had one other advantage that not very many people know this, but the chief economist at the time at Fannie Mae was Henry George's great grandson. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, I believe that the path forward for this stuff is to talk to regular people. I don't think that it's to talk to professors of economics. I don't think it's to talk to financial executives. Happy to talk to those people, but I don't think they're going to be the ones that are going to pick up this ball and run forward with it. I think ordinary people who see that the status quo is not working and that it is driving us off a cliff um, and, are, and are hungry for something different. And there's a lot of those people out there, ordinary people who just see that that the that the the wheels are falling off and the question is you know what comes next and and that's why i think that this is a very timely point in history to be offering this stuff i i think it had i been you know had i lived 30 years ago and and had the thoughts that i'm having i don't know if those ideas would have found i don't know if i would be talking to a group of people like this, um, because I'm sure there were people 30 years ago who 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 knew about this stuff and and had the light bulb moment and and felt passionate about sharing it, but the word didn't get out. Um, I feel like the time is coming where um, where there's going to be maybe an exponentially larger audience for these kinds of ideas. Well, that's what we're working on, isn't it? Yeah. Certainly what the Henry George Skull is all about. Amen. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, for this uh, wonderful lecture and uh, the great contributions as well. Uh, we will meet again next week, uh, 6, 6.30 on Monday. But we do have another event on Tuesday by Dr. Perry, who is going to be coming back again on the Fed. He calls it the Fed's other mandate, regulating wage slavery. Dr. Perry, if you are here, would you mind uh, giving us a little bit of an intro? Oh. Thank you, Ibrahima. Uh, this is one more in my unusual but provably correct analyses of what the Fed is actually up to. Last time I dealt with their mandate to control the money supply and by implication interest rates in the economy. This time we're dealing with the other mandate, which is to regulate unemployment. Between now and next Tuesday, we will get uh, a whole new batch of statistics to work with. Uh, the PCE core is coming out. Uh, the January employment figures will be out and the Treasury's a fiscal bureau statement of account for the month of February will be out and uh, they will provide a great deal of fodder for demonstrating uh, how lies beget lies, garbage in, garbage out. Thank you very much, Dr. Perry, and I look forward to meeting you all next week. Good night. <laughs>